guys, now pay attention. Philip, now you've got to pay attention. <laughs> we have um, uh, the, 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 the Dutch uh, stream right now. I mean, there's one Dutch person leaving the stage, the next Dutch person coming on stage. Um, I don't know why that is. We didn't plan that. I'm just realizing it now. Um, our next guest, um, in my mind, is one of the most interesting thinkers in the world. Seriously, he's a historian. You know, a couple of years ago, we had Yuval Harari here. Um, we have a guy that maybe at some point can fill those shoes. Seriously, I'm, I'm talking Yuval Harari's shoes. Um, he's Dutch, and the best thing about him is he has a very optimistic, sometimes optimistic, um, view of the world, not in all aspects, but in some. Please welcome on stage Rutger Bregman. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Thank you. It's good to have you. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I actually would like to start with, uh, with two simple questions for you, just so that I know a little bit about you as an audience and that I know if I should adjust my talk and also know a little bit about in which direction your moral compass is pointing. So, the question I have is this. Um, are you against slavery? Please raise your hand if you're against slavery. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to see. Let's just assume that the people in the back were not paying attention and are not some kind of moral monsters or anything. Um, now, I've got a second question for you that may be a little bit more difficult to answer, and it's, uh, it's this. Uh, would you have been an abolitionist in the 18th century? An abolitionist was someone who vigorously fought the system of slavery that back then was very common. Are there, is there anyone who thinks that he or she would have been an abolitionist? Wow. There's a lot of self-awareness in this audience. If I would do this talk in America, everyone would be like, yes, 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 I would be on the right side of history. But uh, no, I think you're in fact right. Indeed, very few of us would have stood on the right side of history before it was fashionable. In the 18th century, slavery was a very common system. You know, it existed in Asia, it existed in Africa, it existed in America, and obviously you had the biggest horrific crime of all, which is the transatlantic slave trade, in which pretty much all the countries participated, the European countries. And um, there were very few exceptions. Now, there's one exception, it was this guy, it was Thomas Clarkson. He was one of the main British abolitionists. And I'm focusing on Britain here because, to be honest, there, there really wasn't an abolitionist movement in many other countries. So the Netherlands, for example, there were just zero or pretty much zero abolitionists. There was one British guy who said, this is a cold and dead place. Hurts a little bit to hear that as a Dutch guy, but it's probably true. Um, now, Thomas Clarkson was one of the very few who already 250 years ago fought the system of slavery. He spent his whole life fighting it. Uh, actually, he had sort of a conversion experience when he was 25 years old. And then for seven, seven years, the first seven years, he traveled for 35,000 miles across the whole kingdom, spreading the gospel, spreading abolitionist propaganda, etc., etc. And then he had an utter and total and complete mental breakdown. He had a burnout. Um, so this is what he wrote at the time. Uh, the nervous system was almost shattered to pieces. Both my memory and hearing filled me and going up and down the stairs. Uh, seemed to dance up and down under me, so that misplacing my foot, I sometimes fell. Now, this guy, Thomas Clarkson, I, I sometimes think about him whenever I'm in the self-help section of the modern bookstore. You know, all the kind of books that will teach you how you should live your life, how to be mindful, how to be more relaxed, how to find your true purpose, and t tell you that basically you're good the way you are. At least, it's the kind of book that wants, wants you to feel better about yourself. And then I think about people like Thomas Clarkson and the abolitionists who pretty much did the opposite. They had a knot in their stomach all the time, and they felt really, really bad about it. And they paid a very high price for their ideals. In this case, Thomas Clarkson had a complete burnout, what I would call a virtuous burnout, and which is very much the opposite of what you see a lot today. Obviously, there are a lot of people getting burnouts today, but it's often when they're working jobs that they don't really like to buy stupid stuff they don't need to impress people they don't like either. So um, this is very different. These were people who were morally ambitious. Now, if you think about this, um, 
you can easily get the feeling that the fact that slavery was such a normal idea, such a normal system, that people are just bad, right? That people are just e evil deep down, and that that's just the way it is, with some exceptions, obviously. Now, there's a really uh, old idea embedded in Western culture that scientists call veneer theory. You know, this notion that our civilization is just a thin veneer and that below that lies raw human nature. That supposedly we humans are all just selfish beasts, monsters, or, and, and that we behave very badly, especially in terms of times of crises. Um, so you can already find this idea among the ancient Greeks or among the early Orthodox Christians, you know, the notion of original sin, that we're all sinners deep down. Um, you can find it among the Enlightenment philosophers. I've got one example here, Thomas Hobbes. I don't know if there are any fans of Thomas Hobbes in the audience. Pretty brilliant philosopher. Um, and he, he argued already in the 17th century that in the state of nature, when we were nomadic and togetherers, we humans were, were basically all very selfish. And we were engaging in a war of all against all, and our lives were nasty, brutish, and short. So this idea keeps coming back again and again in our culture. Uh, you could even argue it's embedded at the heart of, of modern capitalism, right? This idea that people are fundamentally selfish and we need to deal with it. I mean, a lot of movies are like that as well. Maybe a lot of Quentin Tarantino movies as well, right? The idea that people are fundamentally beasts. It does make for good entertainment. Now, I have only one problem with veneer theory, with the idea that people are fundamentally selfish. And my problem is, that it's fundamentally, utterly, and totally wrong. We now have collected, in the last couple of decades, a mountain of scientific evidence from anthropology, psychology, archaeology, sociology, you name it, that points in a completely different direction. Actually, that we humans are, well, clearly not angels, but on average, most people are pretty decent and we are an extraordinarily cooperative species. If you ask the question, why have we conquered the globe? Why not the Neanderthals, for example, or the chimpanzees? Well, it's because we have this extraordinary ability to cooperate, and, and we're actually relatively friendly. If you would all be chimpanzees, you know, it wouldn't be so quiet. Uh, it would have been very different. It would have been hard to give this talk. So, um, I think it's time for a new view of human nature. Uh, we radically need to rethink how we look at other people, because what we assume in other people is what we get out of them. And let me just give you a couple of short examples. Um, and a question that scientists have often asked is, uh, what do people do in times of crisis, right? We obviously face this question during the pandemic. Um, another example is what happens after uh, natural disasters. And if you watch a lot of Hollywood movies or series, you might easily get the impression that when there's a natural disaster, when disaster strikes, people panic, right? People start looting, people start plundering. That's the general impression that our culture gives you. Um, but there's actually a basic fact now, very well established uh, in science and in sociology, that a lot of people don't know about. Um, I, I spoke to a Dutch sociology professor, and he, and he told me that even you know, his students often didn't know about it, not freshmen or juniors or grad students, not professionals in most cases, not even emergency uh, responders know about this basic fact of human behavior after a time of crisis, which is when crisis hits, such as here in 2005, Katrina, you know, when New Orleans was flooded, what you actually get is an explosion of cooperation and of altruism. You probably remember this moment, you know, the news was full of stories of looting and plundering and, and violence and all kinds of terrible things. Always when the researchers come in later and they check the rumors, most of the time, you know, it's false, and the vast majority of people actually started helping each other. That is our first instincts during moments like that. It's an essential truth about the human species, that in, in tough times, the vast majority of us, we try to pull together. Now, this is something that evolutionary biologists have also discovered in the last couple of years. So they've been starting to talk about this, survival of the friendliest. And this really means what you think it means. It means that for millennia, it was actually the friendliest among us who had the most kids and had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. 
Right? Pretty much the opposite of what the, the philosopher Thomas Hobbes said. You know, if, if you lived as a nomadic hunter gatherer during the Ice Age, it was obviously an incredibly tough environment. So, how were you going to survive? Well, you survived if you had enough friends, right? Your friends were your insurance policy. If you were very shameless or narcissistic, well, it was going to be more difficult. So, it was very important that you actually uh, took care of others. Here, here's one really striking fact that I discovered during my research. We humans, We're the only species in the whole animal kingdom with the ability to blush. Right? We involuntarily give away our feelings to other members of our species in order to establish trust. So, this survival of the friendliest theory has been developed quite powerfully in the last couple of decades, and we now also have archaeological evidence for it. So, the, the scientific term is self domestication, the idea that we are domesticated, just like the wolf has been turned into a, you know, a nice and friendly dog. And a similar process has probably happened with us, humans. So at the bottom, you, see, you can see uh, an illustration of what happened to us. Um, you may think, Rodger, you're really good at drawing. That's correct, but this is from a scientific journal. Um, and what you see here is what happened to our skulls, to our faces, in the last 50, 40, 30, 20, 10,000 years. We've literally started to look much nicer and friendlier, right? So compared to our ancestors, we have really been the product of this survival of the friendliest. Now, I've got a term for this. Uh, I call it homo puppy. Uh, I hope to be remembered in the annals of science, and it's not very likely, but uh, um, that is really the secret of our success, you could say, as a species. Again, if you ask this question, why have we conquered the globe? Why not the Neanderthals? Why not the bonobos? Why not the chimpanzees? We always love to say that, oh, it's because we're so smart. Well, actually, Neanderthals have bigger brains than we did, so that's highly unlikely. No, it's, it's our ability to work together, to learn from one another, and that really helps if you have friends. Now, then I come back to the original question, and I come back to this guy, Thomas Clarkson. Now, was Thomas Clarkson one of the first abolitionists? Was he a homo puppy? Was he the kind of person who just wanted to be liked, who was just friendly to everyone? Well, the opposite is true, of course. Sometimes our yearning to be liked, our yearning to be part of a group, is exactly the problem. And sometimes, actually, this need to be friendly and to be nice to one another stands in the way of justice and of truth. You know, these abolitionists, they made life pretty uncomfortable for themselves and for those around them. So that, that brings me to the final and ultimate question, which is, Who are today's abolitionists? Are there any among you? Because it's fairly easy for us to look back on the crimes of the past, slavery, the witch hunts, etc. But surely the historians of the future will look back on us and think, okay, they did some terrible things that they should have changed. So that's sort of the one message I wanted to give you to you today is that maybe we sometimes need to redefine what it means to be ambitious and also raise our level of moral ambition. Thank you very much. Before we get into questions, I want to welcome somebody on stage that basically ennobles our event here. I'm, I'm super proud to have her. Um, she will be with us throughout the day, here and there, in several different um, setups. Um, many of the things that I have done as an entrepreneur um, are modeled after what she's done. She's uh, founded a digital conference. She has a um, media side, the founder media side, Recode. She's a huge podcaster, among other podcasts, as a pivot podcaster. And she's a journalist. She has them all in the interviews. Please welcome on stage, Kara Swisher. Ooh. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, it's so good to have you. Hey, Roger. <laughs> okay. How you doing? How you doing? So good to see you. Um, backstage, they have weird smoke and a camera following you. <laughs> <laughs> I think evil. <laughs> um, so I want to talk, Roger and I talked for my Sway podcast for the New York Times in mm -hmm. December, and 
I, to say I'm completely opposite to Rutger in terms of a point of view about humanity is probably understating the situation. And so I just want to read at the beginning of a question. Um, he was talking about, he almost called his book Rousseau Was Right. Yeah. Um, I'm a Hobbesian kind of character. Um, and I just want to um, have your answer. And I was talking, uh, you were talking about wanting to call it that, Rousseau Was Right. And I said, so Thomas Hobbes had the idea that we, and then I said, humans sucked, correct? And you said, yeah, humans sucked and in the state of nature when we were still nomadic hunter-gatherers. We were engaging in a war against all. Rousseau made the opposite argument where he said, in the state of nature, we live lives that are actually pretty good, egalitarian, and everything went wrong when we came to this concept called civilization. There's a beautiful passage in his essay in the origin of inequality where he says, you know, the first moment when someone said, this piece of land here, that's mine, that's when everything went wrong. And I would say in the short summary of my book is that most people deep down are pretty decent. That's not necessarily the same as being an actually good person. I mean, clearly we're not angels. But in German, there's a way of expressing it in that hmm. I really like, they would say, we're im Grunde gut. So sort of the basis, there's something good within us that we can build on. So that's what we were talking about the time. And at the time, you were talking about the creation of vaccines for COVID and how it was a worldwide effort for mm -hmm. good. Since then, Ukraine, the continued series of election lies in the United States, the recession, things have sort of gotten worse. Mm -hmm. So I'd love your sort of take on how, whether it has been shifted because of what's happening. I'm going to use the, what's happening in Ukraine as a perfect example, atrocities. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. How do you mm -hmm. look at your point of view towards humanity in that? Hmm. So obviously when you write a book about human decency, you have to struggle with human evil as well, right? right. So you have to go on for hundreds of pages about all the terrible atrocities that, that have happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess what I try to say is that the explanation that people are some fundamentally evil or selfish, it's just too simplistic, and we need to have a much more layered explanation of how sure. societies can poison themselves. So one thing I would point out in the case of Russia is, well, we clearly see the corruption of power going on there, right? This would be my shortest summary. Most people are pretty decent, but power corrupts. Mm -hmm. And you can, only, you can see it in the photos where the dictator, you know, Putin is, is sitting at this table, and it's a very long table, and there's this very real disconnection of him with the rest of humanity. Yeah. And in that sense, he's, he's denying something that's super fundamental to humans, which is actually our connection to one another. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps us sane. That's what keeps sure. us smart. Um, but in, in that case, something has gone terribly wrong. All right. So, you, so what, what would explain that? Where is the decency there? Because there is an entire population that could do something about it, right? That mm -hmm. there isn't any action anywhere within that country about what are clear war crimes that are happening. That they're, they're right now, they're coming out of, um, uh, of Kharkiv and seeing more of the same kind of atrocities. How do you, it seems more common, and then of course in the United States this week, we had several shootings because we're gun crazy in the United States, but there was one particular one in Buffalo, 10 people killed by a young man who was a white supremacist. Mm -hmm more common than ever. And he, of course, used all of technology to facilitate this. How do you deal with that when you have a technology? And one of the, ish, one of the things that struck me about that particular shooting was how separate and unconnected he was, yet he was fully connected with a group of people who actually listened to him just before the shootings and didn't contact law enforcement. Yeah, he was yeah. in discussions with people about what yeah. he was about to do. Yeah. And maybe they didn't think he was serious or something else, but no one moved to do anything about it. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, and that's pure evil is what happened there, obviously. How do you create that decency when the lack of connection is so profound because of technology uh -huh. and other things? Not just well, long you, men you mentioned station. the word pure evil. And I mean, we've all, or many of us have seen the Batman movies with, with the Joker. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of the symbol of pure evil. Someone sure. who just enjoys seeing other people suffer and yeah. just wants to see the world burn, basically. Mm -hmm. And I do think those people exist. But I'm saying they're very, very rare. So pure sadist sadists are out there, but they're very, very rare. Actually, the vast majority of terrible crimes are committed by people who genuinely believe they're on the right side of history, who actually sure. believe they're doing the good thing, 
which is, I'm not condoning anything here, but that's, that's, that's really important if you want to understand what's going on. In my book, I've got one chapter about the Danish way of dealing with um, people who are radicalizing and who might, you know, a couple of years ago, were thinking about going to Syria to, mm -hmm. to join the war there and maybe even become a terrorist when they come back. And what they really tried was to use what scientists call strategic empathy to get into the head of the opponent, not to condone anything, but to try and understand what's going on. And one of the things they realized is that these people were just yearning basically for meaning and mm -hmm. for connection. And they did something that many people would find abhorrent, which yeah. is basically drink a cup of tea with these kids. Sure. Say, OK, what's going on in your life, etc. Yeah. Turn the other cheek. Right. And it's the most effective counterterrorism program pretty much in Europe, maybe in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, you've got to make the distinction here between condoning and, and understanding, I think. So, but when you have a, a society that is now, now this is one of the first gatherings I've been at since the pandemic, obviously yeah. the lack of connection, except for technological connection, I think is sort of stress the human race in a, mm -hmm. in a way that's unprecedented. Even more than owning land or fighting over, I mean, what's happening in Ukraine is a fight over land, over, over hegemony. Yeah. Um, how do you create those connections in a technology forward environment? Because it's only as we move into virtual reality, eventually the metaverse, which is not coming to you by Facebook, just so you all, you'll be fine. It won't be Facebook that will give it to you, but there mm -hmm. will be a, a version of that. How do you then create, if we have such a problem in this world, and then with the technology on top of it, it gets worse. There's never been more uh, hate and um, divisiveness online. And just now in the US elections, a lot of the election lies have been profound in terms of impact on voting. Mm -hmm. How do you create that connection to pull out the, what you think is the decency in hmm. people? Hmm. So I guess my challenge to the audience or people in general would be to think about where do your ideals and values actually hurt? I mean, I started with the question, are you against slavery? And then everyone's like, yeah, sure, I'm against slavery. Well, that's sure. an easy that's, one, but it's okay. It's very easy today. But yeah. in the 18th century, it would have been very different. Yeah. So I think if your ideals don't really hurt, you know, if you don't pay a price for them, you can ask yourself the question, are they really worthwhile? In Europe, obviously, on a country level, that's, that's a really big question. Are we willing to pay the price, for example, to import much less oil and gas? Then the bills will Correct. go up, and maybe that's going to be problematic for us. Uh, but if we're really serious about this, we've got to be willing to pay that price, mm -hmm. right? So that, that would be one, one challenge. How do you get people willing to, because right now there's a lot of stresses. I, hmm. There's just a story today about that idea in the New York Times about mm -hmm. that they don't want to pay the stresses, that they're willing to forego what are clear, again, war crimes going on in Ukraine yeah. in order to be able to drive your car for $20 cheaper, whatever, euros cheaper. Yeah. Well, look, I'll say something optimistic. That's my job, okay, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. I am astounded by the generational difference that we see happening already. So I recently visited my old student society in Utrecht, and it just the, the difference between when I was a member was, was enormous. You know, topics of whether sexual harassment or, um, uh, you know, many people have turned vegetarian or even vegan. Uh, that wasn't the case at all just 10 years ago. So I'm excited about this, this yearning for meaning and maybe being a bit more morally ambitious in young people today. And I, and I hope we can continue to grow that. All right. I think you're, I hope you're right. I think you're wrong, but I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. You guys, one more question. I'm a tone of micro from Philip or from Echo, you know? Yeah. Uh, Ek and I were just discussing if uh, your theory that a crisis brings out the best in people, if it's really correct and if it's long-term correct. If you, if you just look right now on, on German politics, if you see the war in Ukraine, um, that the people first were helping a lot, but right now it's more the discussion how high are going to be the gas prices and they don't want to, the majority of Germans don't want to uh, send heavy weapons. How do you, how do you think about that? Sure. I mean, as time passes, things become more difficult. But I think still you've got to acknowledge that there's been a major shift, right, in Germany and German politics, not just because of the war, but also, for example, of the floodings recently that happened that really generate more and more awareness. I think we Europeans, sorry, we Europeans can be a little bit more proud sometimes of what we're doing 
In terms of climate policy, for example, we're leading the world, right? The most ambitious climate legislation comes out of Brussels. We're not very good at giving speeches about it. You know, the Americans are very good at talking about the, the new Green Deal or blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, our politicians give very boring speeches in European Parliament and no one listens. Uh, <laughs> but we're doing much, much better often than, than we think we are. We're not nearly where we should be, but I'm, I'm actually quite proud to be European these days. And then, then one, one last question from you guys. Echo, Philip, and then one more question. Are you, are you good? Are you good? Okay, okay, okay. So then we're good. Um, Rutger, thank you very much for coming out here. <laughs> Thanks, <man>. Thanks. <laughs>